Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Ulysses Grant, and the focus is commanding general to commander-in-chief. The year is 1869, it's March 4th, and Grant is being inaugurated as the 18th President of the United States. Now, he's certainly not the first general to be elevated to the top civilian spot in the U.S. government, but he's only the second to do it with zero political background. Only he and Zachary Taylor had never held political office before becoming President of the United States. Well, Grant gave a substantive inaugural address in which he focused initially on the economy. It was really important to Grant to pay off the Civil War debts, which were still pretty big on the books, and to do so as much as possible in gold. Hard currency, that was the footing that he wanted the United States government, get rid of all these paper greenbacks that had been issued during the war, and get back on more of a specie-based economy. Grant also talked about equitable treatment in his inaugural address, equitable treatment in foreign affairs and in domestic affairs, and he specifically told, called out two groups, blacks and Indians. And we'll talk about his policies in those areas a little bit later in this episode. Well, like any new president, Grant had to form a cabinet, and Grant's cabinet was nothing but a headache for him for the entire time in office. He went through 26 secretaries, just seven jobs, 26 people over the course of his eight years, more than any to date in American history. Well, there were a couple of them, in fact, who didn't make it out of the first week, including his former congressman, Elijah Washburn, who had been a big supporter of Grant's during the Civil War. Well, Washburn got the job as Secretary of State, and less than a week later, he resigned. Never sure why, but he was renominated to a different position, Minister to France. He was off to Paris for the next eight years. Then there's the story of Alexander Stewart. When Grant was elected president, he decided to sell his home in Washington. After all, he's moving into the White House, didn't need to carry this house. And Stewart comes along and offers Grant double what he had just paid for. Okay, that's fine. Grant took that money, put it in his pocket, and almost immediately thereafter nominated uh, Stewart to be his Secretary of the Treasury. One problem, Stewart was ineligible. There was a law in the books going back to almost the beginning of the Republic that said that any businessmen were ineligible to be Secretary of the Treasury. They thought there was some kind of conflict at the time. And so Grant asked for a waiver, thought that he could get Stewart through, could not. Stewart was out. George Boutwell was in. By the way, Hamilton Fish took over at the State Department. Then there's the War Department. You got John Rollins, who had been Grant's loyal aide for the entire Civil War, and Rollins was dying. He had tuberculosis, and this was the job he wanted, and Grant wanted to give it to him, so he did. But it created an interesting conflict with two of Grant's closest friends and people that he had worked with so closely during the war, Rollins and William Sherman, who had just taken over as commanding general with Grant vacating that spot. Grant had already told Sherman that all the department heads in the army would work directly for him, but Rollins wanted them working directly for him. Grant's now in the middle. Rollins is dying. He says, I'm going to side with Rollins for now, and Sherman's upset. So Sherman comes to the White House, says, Grant, you just told me I think we're all going to work for me. And Grant said, well, if it was my order, can't I change my mind? And Sherman basically said, okay, but he wasn't happy about it. He commented at the time that Grant is a mystery to me, and I believe he is a mystery to himself. They still worked closely together, maybe not quite as closely as they were during the war. Some other notable appointments, including a former general in the Confederacy and also a former friend of Grant, James Longstreet. Longstreet, who had been Grant's friend be from before the war, was one of the few Confederate generals who actually supported the new constitutional amendments after the Civil War. Now, he was decried for this in the South, but Grant thought this was a great move and he could reward his old friend with the job of surveyor of customs in the port of New Orleans. He was now part of the administration. Also involved, a couple of uh, other close aides Horace Porter, Orville Babcock. They would be Grant's personal secretaries, along with his oldest son, Fred Grant. Well, Julia Grant, though, might have been the happiest one of all. She was thrilled to be the first lady of the United States, to lead all the social activities in Washington, ready to move into her new home in the White House, which she found to be an absolute mess. Looks like the Johnsons had done very little to clean up after some of the troubles during the Civil War, and so one of the first things she set out to do was to renovate her new home. One of the Grant's first uh, challenges on his plate was, in fact, in that economy. And it had to do with his plan to get the United States on a hard currency footing. This sounded like an opportunity to a couple of businessmen in New York, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. They thought, well, you know what, if we buy all the gold, corner the market, 
Grant wants the gold, then the government will have to pay us a premium. So they didn't really care as much about what that would do to the U.S. economy as long as it would help their pocketbooks. And they weren't going to leave things to chance. They had some people on the take, including Grant's new brother-in-law, Abel Corbin, had just married Grant's sister, and he was on the take to tell Fisk and Gould anything he could find out about Grant's plans for the currency. Also on the take, Daniel Butterfield. He was one of the top gold buyers in the Treasury Department. If he could give some advance information to the plans of the government, again, he would be rewarded. Well, Fisk and Gould started buying gold there in early September, and their plan was to buy all the gold in New York, literally buy it all. About the September 20th, their order started getting bigger. The price is going up and up. They're not caring because they figure they're still going to get a great premium. And by the 24th, they placed an order for $100 million in gold at any price. Well, at this point, everybody in town knows what's going on. The financial markets are in a panic, and Grant has to figure out what to do. Well, first thing he did was he figured out Corbin was involved in this and he chastised his sister and Corbin over that, but then he had to get back to business. He and his treasury secretary, George Boutwell, had a bold plan. They were gonna to try to reset the market, sell $4 million of government gold at the price from before this big run-up by Gould and Fisk. And that's what they did and the market reset. Ended up just barely okay. A little bit longer, and the feeling was that Gould and Fisk were going to have all the gold and the U.S. government was going to be subject to them. So, so they did solve this problem, but again, some of that naivete and trust by, by, by Grant involved in this process of the people around him, this would be a theme of challenge for him going forward. Grant and Secretary Fish were very active in foreign affairs, beginning with Cuba, where there was an uprising. And in fact, Cuba had been a, a spot the United States presidents had been trying to acquire for years. That would not be the case here, but Secretary Rollins wanted to at least recognize the rebels, perhaps give them some support so that they could take over that island nation. And there was a conflict in the cabinet about this. Grant had to make the decision. He did on the spot. He wrote it out by hand. He said, look, I'm not gonna recognize the rebels. I will offer arbitration. If, either, if both sides want uh, me to arbitrate, the United States will do that. Otherwise, we're not gonna get involved. Rollins was kind of crushed by this. It was a big deal to him, but he wasn't around much longer. He, in fact, passed within a couple of weeks of this decision. Also in the Caribbean, Santa Domingo, which we now know as, as the Dominican Republic, had expressed some potential interest of being acquired by the United States. And a couple of previous presidents had talked about this because they all wanted the Samana Bay, which was a potential spot for the U.S. Navy. Well, instead of Grant sending members from his State Department in to negotiate, he actually sent Orville Babcock, one of his own personal secretaries, which is a little strange, but he sent Babcock in to negotiate. Babcock came back and said, yeah, they will be, be willing to be annexed by the United States, we'll get that naval base for only covering a million and a half dollars in their public debt. Well, Grant was happy about this, but he knew he had to play this wisely because any treaty, of course, had to go through the Senate. That meant Senate Foreign Relations and the chairman, Charles Sumner, who was a bit of a prickly person, couldn't necessarily rely on him to fall in the line. So Grant went and saw Sumner at his house. They talked about it. Sumner sort of said all the right things, but Grant kind of heard what he wanted to hear. Sumner was not really committing and, in fact, was against the idea. When Grant formally issued the, the treaty to the Senate, Sumner buried it in committee for a couple of months. In fact, it was about to expire when Grant got him at least to bring it out in the open when Sumner actually came out against it. They took a vote in the Senate. The treaty would not pass and Santo Domingo would not be annexed. The U.S. did have more success with Britain during this period. Now, the British were in the crosshairs a little bit over a ship called the Alabama, which was a British-made ship that had gotten into the hands of the Confederates. And that was a little unclear how that happened, but the Confederates used it against the Union Navy, and now the, uh, the Americans wanted the British to pay for this ship getting in the hands of the Confederacy. Well, the, conf uh, the negotiations weren't very, going very well in Britain, so Grant suggested that they move them to Washington, D.C., which is what they did, and Secretary Fish took the leadership spot in these negotiations, and they went really well. They not only got an agreement to go to arbitration over the Alabama, they settled longstanding issues with access to the fisheries in the North Atlantic. They also uh, negotiated a reciprocal trade agreement with Canada. This was the best footing that the U.S. and Britain had been on in years. 
Now, as we talked about before, the issue of Indians uh, was first and foremost on the minds of, of Ulysses Grant from the beginning of his presidency. And he's really the only president since Washington who had tried to make this a focal point. Washington had tried. It did not go well. Most presidents since had simply given lip service to this challenge. There were about 100 tribes in the United States when Grant became president. 225,000 Indians. The U.S. government had an issued 370 treaties over the years, and they had violated most of them. Grant acknowledged this in his first annual message to Congress when he said the wrongs inflicted upon him, the Indian, should be taken into account and the balance placed to his credit. Our dealings with the Indian properly lay us open to charges of cruelty and swindling. Can not the Indian be made a useful and productive member of society? If the effort is made in good faith, we will stand better before the civilized nations of the earth and our own consciences for having made it. He was serious about this. He put Eli Parker, a former member of his staff in the war, as the commissioner of Indian affairs. Parker himself was a former Seneca or was a member of the Seneca tribe thought he could build trust with the Indian, with the Indian tribes. He, Grant also turned to religious groups, particularly Quakers, to take on the jobs of Indian agents, again, trying to create a trust-based environment. Grant's goal, in part, was expressed in this same message when he said to bring all the Indians upon reservations, where they will live in houses and have schoolhouses and churches, and will be pursuing peaceful and self-sustaining avocations, and where they may be visited by the law-abiding white man with the same impunity that he now visits the civilized white settlements. He even welcomed some of the chiefs to the White House in 1870, was making some progress, and then it all fell apart. Parker was accused of malfeasance. He denied it. He eventually was cleared by an investigation by the House, but his relationship with Grant soured over this. He resigned and they became estranged. More so, there was violence at hand. In particular, General Edward Canby was negotiating this settlement with the Modoc tribe when he was shot and killed right at the negotiating table. Well, that created obviously a big uproar. There was the Modoc War, the Red River War with a different tribe, the Great Sioux War was underway as the, as the violence on the, on the frontier continued to escalate. Sioux War, that was Custer and his uh, battle at Little Bighorn, Custer's last stand. Despite all of Grant's efforts at the beginning of his administration, in the end, it really came for naught. And the Indians would still not have full citizenship in the United States for another 50 years. The other race that Grant had foremost in his mind, of course, was the black race. And this was his biggest domestic challenge, the freedmen, the freed slaves in the South who were now being subject to laws black codes, they were called, state laws that were clearly discriminatory against, against the black man. And the question was, what was the federal government going to do about it? When President Andrew Johnson was president, he was advocating states' rights to get the South back into the country, but allow them to sort of manage their own domestic affairs. He was not going to interfere. But Grant thought they were actually losing a lot of ground that they had won during the war with these discriminatory policies that were being enforced by local, uh, local law enforcement to the detriment of blacks. And plus, you had these new civilian uprisings, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, that was using violence and intimidation to continue to subject the black man and, and families in, in the South to very little rights. Well, Grant didn't want to sit idly by, and he asked Congress for authority to do something about it. Congress complied. The Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871 gave Grant authority to go after these uh, members of the South who he believed were violating federal statute and the new constitutional amendments. And he put Amos Ackerman on point, who went out with a thousand prosecutions in 1870 alone. Congress passed the KKK bill in 1871, Federal troops were now deployed. 3,000 prosecutions took place uh, during that year, and it was having an impact. Civil rights advocate, the former slave Frederick Douglass, was certainly noticing about Grant. He said, I know Grant well. At all times, he gave every aid to the development of the industry and of the improvement of the colored race. He was certainly trying, but he couldn't sustain it. Several things went against Grant, especially as he got into the second term. Apathy in the North. There just wasn't a lot of enthusiasm anymore for sending soldiers from the North into the South to deal with what was deemed domestic policies. Congress was having less of an influence because more Southern Democrats were taking seats in Congress, including former Confederates. The votes were going to be less and less 
to go and override the, rule, the, the activities in the states in the South. And then the Supreme Court got involved as well with two critical cases. They were Reese v. U.S. and U.S. v. Cruikshank. In Reese, in a 7-2 decision, this was focused on the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks the right to vote. They could not be discriminated against at the polls based on race. But the way the courts interpreted this in Reese, it was they couldn't uh, discriminate based on race, but there were plenty of other conditions that could be placed by the states on people for the right to vote. So you'd have poll taxes, literacy tests, and other things that were clearly uh, designed to inhibit the ability of the black man to have access to the polls. And this was now the Supreme Court's decision. Nothing Grant could do about this. In Cruikshank, five to four decision was focused on the 14th Amendment, particularly the due process and equal protection clauses. According to the court, these clauses in the 14th Amendment only applied to the federal government. The federal government could not violate these principles, but state governments could and individuals could. Well, this just opened the door to the South to do all kinds of discrimination that once again, there was nothing the federal government seemingly could do about it. Grant once again tried. In fact, he was really the only post-Civil War president who really tried to have uh, a lot of support for the freedmen in the South during Reconstruction. But in the end, he was largely unsuccessful. In Reflections later on, Grant said about Reconstruction, looking back over the whole policy of Reconstruction, it seems to me that the wisest thing would have been to have continued for some time the military rule. That would have enabled the Southern people to pull themselves together and repair material losses. Military rule would have been just to all. The black man who wanted freedom, the white man who wanted protection, the Northern man who wanted union, the trouble about the military rule in the South was that our people did not like it. It was not in accordance with our institutions. I am clear now that it would have been better to have postponed suffrage, reconstruction, state governments for 10 years and held the South in a territorial condition, but we made our scheme and must do what we can with it. Grant tried, it didn't really work out, and there wasn't much to help the civil rights of blacks for about the next 90 years. So it's a decent first term for Grant. Mostly Andrew Johnson was gone. The country was rallying around sort of Grant as a unifying force. He had fought off the gold scandal and made some inroads in foreign affairs. He had tried with blacks and Indians. It didn't go so well there, but the electorate was happy. It returned Grant for a second term. In fact, he got over 80% of the vote in the electoral college over Horace Greeley, a newspaper man. His second term, that was gonna be even more troubling, but that's the story for another day. That is Ulysses Grant commanding general to commander-in-chief. From the life of Ulysses Grant, for more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.